Hello and welcome back to Trust Issues, the podcast where we used to track the first 100 days of Liz Trust with his premiership, and now we're tracking the first 100 days of Rishi Sunak's premiership. We don't have a new title yet, though. We're sticking with Trust Issues for the moment. There's some good ideas floating around in the comments on last episode, but we're yet to nail it down. We need to come up with new branding and stuff. It, take, it takes a minute. We'll get there. These are still Trust's issues, though, but they're issues Trust created that Sunak is dealing mm. with. That makes sense. That good justification? Yeah, it sort of makes sense. Joining me today are Zach Michaelis, TLDR's Editor-in-Chief. Hello. And Ben Blissett, TLDR UK's lead writer. Hello. How are you both doing? Good. Good. Another Good. busy week. Yeah, yeah uh, another busy week. Yeah. Just the for beginning. For politics, for us. Yeah. Just yeah. generally. What, why are we busy at the minute, Jack? Why, oh, uh, thank you for that segue. Oh, that was super. Flawless. Well done, guys. If we hadn't called that out, that would have been... Oh. Um, we're busy because last time we did the podcast... We mentioned that we were doing a fire sale on our pin badges, and we haven't really promoted the pin badges in about a year. But we mentioned in the last podcast and said, hey, doing a fire sale, we're trying to clear them out. Um, we expected to sell some, but we thought, it's just a podcast. We'll mention it in a main video, and it'll, like, it'll do well. You guys bought too many. <laughs> like, I mean, not too many. We appreciate it. But it, it takes ages. We, we've spent the last couple of days doing basically nothing but sorting that, and we're still not even close to done. So if you ordered some last week, Thank you. Uh, we appreciate it. Give us a minute. It takes a while. Um, if you haven't ordered yet, though, there's a fun bonus reason to order now. And that's because we're coming up to our 10,000th order from the TLDR store. And we've decided that the 10,000th order will be delivered by hand by Team TLDR. How it will work is we'll break into teams and we'll be racing to your front door, no matter where you are in the world. And the team who get there first, I don't know what they win yet. We'll work it out. We'll work it out. But essentially, you could flight. have your order hand-delivered by us. You could meet us at your front door. We might come in if we're <laughs> invited in. If your house doesn't look too weird. If it's a creepy-looking, like, vampire house, we might, we might not come in. Uh, vampire house <laughs> is a Halloween weird example. Halloween theme joke, Halloween, I guess. Spooky. There you go. Um, and we'll go for a drink or something. So if you want that to be your house, order now. TLDR store. Uh, the fire sale is still going on. So place your orders. We could meet you. Do you anyway. want to say how much they are? Oh, would you like me to? This, I, I, feel like I was going to, but I felt like the promo was too long already. Okay. Let's just, I'll just quickly run through them. All badges are £2.49 if you pick them individually. Or you can get a mystery badge for £1.99. You can get five mystery badges for £7.49 or ten mystery badges for £11.99. Now, you might be thinking that is more than it was on Monday. And yeah, it is. <laughs> we should have bought them on Monday, I guess. They, they sold out so quickly that we needed to put the prices up. Otherwise, it was just like taking up all of our time. So apologies, but buy them now because they might be more by next time we speak to you. Anyway, also since last time we spoke to you and in the time that we have not been doing politics, but instead been packing pin badges, um, Rishi Sunak had his first PMQs. It was a head-to-head, -head, Sunak versus Starmer. A lot of talk on Twitter about it. Um, does one of you want to run through what happened during PMQ, something like the key moments, and then we'll kind of reflect on his performance, what it means going forward? I didn't, know, yeah, I didn't watch it. So oh, right, okay. He was probably... packing pin badges. Yeah, sorry, I forgot about the pin badges. This is going to be an insightful discussion about how he did, isn't it, considering <laughs> we haven't seen it. Yeah, so basically it was, as you say, it was his you first... You have watched it. I have watched okay, it, good. yeah. It was his first PMQs. Um, Starmer tried to land a couple of blows on him. Mm -hmm. So he, he tried to bring up uh, things like the Swell of Raverman uh, case, which I'm sure we'll get into later. We will. Um, he brought up the uh, Sunak's wealth, so just for context, he's... He's the richest MP in Parliament currently and probably in the history of Parliament. Yeah. He's got personal wealth about seven, eight hundred million pounds. Twice so, the personal wealth of the king, right? Yes. Yes. So but he, so they you um, could buy the king twice. It's not not sure how that works. That'd be quite fun though. Prime Minister buys the king and comes in with like the crown and that one. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jack. Um so yeah, so you attack that. <laughs> also, um, I brought up quite an old uh, point, which was from the uh, leadership election earlier this year, when Sunak had said that he was wanting to divert, um, levelling up funds from northern towns. Yes. So he tried, tried to uh, bring that up. One of the most interesting points was the one of the most interesting points made by Starmer, at least, um, was that he tried to uh, frame uh, the Swell of Braverman uh, situation as. Sunak making a grubby little deal was the phrase with Suella Braverman to put uh, his party ahead of the country. Yeah. And then Sunak hit back and made some joke about um, Sunak helping, uh, about stuff like Starmer and Sunak. It's starting to yeah. confuse me. Uh, but anyway, uh, about the fact that he'd um, backed Jeremy Corbyn a few years ago. 
So they somehow turned it on that. It makes no sense. It's do you want great. To, don't you have, do you want to explain the Suella Braverman thing? Should we people? do that now? Yeah, well, I feel like we just made a reference to it. So. Yeah, so Suella Braverman was Home Secretary last week. Yeah. She was uh, sacked. I mean, she was kind of pushed, but she was sacked mm -hmm. uh, because she'd been sending emails with sensitive government information on, on her personal accounts to backbench Tory MPs. Yeah. Um, there's also been some uh, accusations that she'd also CC'd into the email someone else, like the partner of a backbench MP, which really, really isn't good. Sure. Uh, obviously, less than a week later, um, Sunak becomes... So she resigned over that too? Yeah, uh, well, she was, yeah, she, she was, was kind of sacked, sure. but yeah, yeah. She, she resigned. Uh, less than a week later, she's brought back in as Home Secretary uh, by Sunak. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, the opposition's had a field day with this by saying that, you know, she was sacked because she broke the ministerial code, there's implications of national security, yeah. and her punishment was less than a week off. <laughs> uh, that was basic, that's, you know, and, yeah. and Starmer's been running with this, Labour's been running with this. Um, the development today has been that uh, apparently MI5 is going to give her a bit of a course on oh. uh, what how to deal with sensitive information That's nice. which is a bit humiliating for her but I, um, I think is aimed you know it's trying to put it's the public's mind at rest I feel like they ought to do that for every like if you're in a position like that anyway I think she probably already had some training on it but she's having more but she's having more okay. you know so when you get a couple of points on your license yeah. <laughs> you've got to go do the course yeah yeah exactly so that's what's going on and yeah there was a lot of references to that in PMQs this sure week. Um, let's stay on that then for a second. Um, do we think that this is damaging for uh, for Sunak? Do you think this will stick, the kind of Braverman deal thing? I mean, obviously, we probably won't be talking about it in months' time. But what do you think the implications are? And do you think uh, Braverman will kind of stay in the position longer term? I'm happy to, yeah, go on, I'll go. Um, I think the consensus in Westminster and amongst journalists is that it is a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason people think it's a mistake is just obviously the optics aren't great because yeah. you've just rehired someone who was fired a week ago for breaching the ministerial code. Um, I think you're right though. It doesn't really make a material difference to Sunak's popularity in, in the medium term. I think yeah. this story would have, would have gone in a couple of days time, um, especially once he announces his fiscal package or whatever it's called that's supposed to be due on November 17th. And that's that's really going to determine the trajectory of his premiership. So this sort of stuff is by the by. The reason he did it is because there are basically two criteria by which he's picked his cabinet. One is whether or not they can help him achieve party unity. And, and the other is previous experience in the ministerial position mm -hmm. relevant. Um, Braverman was assigned because obviously she represents uh, that right wing of the Tory party that Sunak isn't particularly, well, doesn't have a particularly strong affinity with. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's that's the sense in which she's there. She's there to try and provide a sense of party unity between Sunak and that wing of the party. Um, I, I think, again, I think actually it's, it's a sort of token symbol, um, token gesture. I think really whether or not the right wing of the party tolerates Sunak going forward will just depend on whether or not he can improve poll numbers um, mm -hmm. because ultimately there's not enough ideological overlap between those two to be any sort of sense of permanent loyalty. Yeah. Uh, it's just going to be a transactional relationship that will depend on whether or not Sunak can guarantee them their jobs. I think the, the only other thing to say about the, um, the Braverman uh, case is the fact that, that only a day before that had come out at, in, in PMQs and that mm -hmm. all happened, Sunak made his first speech in front of 10 Downing Street when he became Prime Minister, saying that he wanted to lead his government with professionalism. Yeah. Um, and the fact that that's happened within his first day, as Zach said, I think it probably will be forgotten in a couple of days, but it's just set, it, depending on, on how he continues yeah. and whether scandals continue and scandals of that nature continue, this could be seen as sort of the first scandal. Um, sure. And it can be seen as building does, into a wider it, picture. It does certainly go some way to undermine his statements on the first day. Yeah. Not fully and certainly not in the eyes of everyone, but there's... It's a clear departure from the kind of values that he was stating originally. And I think a lot of people are hoping for a real clean divide between the kind of Johnson, more kind of, I don't know, populist chaos. And they're hoping for something more traditional and more kind of like by the book. And while this hasn't broken any rules per se, it's like, it's not, not, not yeah, the it's best not start for that message. Um, let's leave that there, the Braverman situation. Obviously one of the things you said that was one of the things that was mentioned in PMQs um, on Wednesday. Uh, you also ran through some of the other things that happened, kind of discussion mm. around Sunak's wealth, um, the diverting of funds away from poorer constituencies as part of levelling up. Um, so those are kind of the core 
areas of discussion. What did you make of PMQs more generally? What did you make of the back and forth during that? Well, it was a bit more... Um, in, so, obviously, with Boris Johnson, there was a lot more sort of bluster, and he has a particular style of speaking. Mm -hmm. I'd say that it came across much more, in terms of the way that both of them, them speak and... and um, the sort of the way that they were attacking each other was reminded me a lot more of sort of the Cameron era of mm -hmm. uh, PMQs. I think with Theresa May, there was she she had sort of a um, she had a very difficult situation. She often had either a minority or only a very small majority. So there was, yeah. she wasn't leading a united party, and they, they, it just came across as at times a bit weak. Um, Liz Truss only did about two, so it's hard to really judge her. Sure. But um, the Tories seemed a lot more united. They were a lot more feisty. Yeah. They were a lot more attacking Labour. They were they genuinely seemed quite um, excited by the fact that Sunak was the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. I think that obviously is the case, you know, because he he uh, won the MP vote over summer. Yeah. Um, he again won this leadership election with the MP. Like the MPs backed Sunak. They didn't yeah. back Truss. So I think that there was it was the first time in a long time that you've seen sort of the Tories that sort of mm -hmm. um, loud, you know, excited behind yeah. uh, their, their leader. So I think that was quite interesting. Labour, again, they were obviously quite feisty as well, and yeah. Starmer had landed some some pretty decent blows against Sunak. They both landed some pretty good um, jokes and things like that against each other. I think the interesting thing will be there was a lot of criticism of Sunak coming out of it around his unwillingness to answer questions. There was definitely a lot of question dodging, which isn't uncommon from any prime minister, any party, any mm. decade, whatever, like that's classic. Um, and also some people flagging the use of kind of kind of Johnsonisms and a lot of, like a lot of classic Johnson lines. It will be interesting whether, I mean, it makes sense, especially dodging questions. He's been there, what, two days? Like he should be prepared to some extent, but like the first week, give that a pass. Let's see if that continues. And the Johnson lines will be interesting if that's a strategy continues down the kind of standard Johnsonian attacks because I do think as you say they both speak and act very differently I think a lot of the things that worked for Johnson as kind of like punchy little attacks and whatever work in that kind of blustery jokey manner and I'm not sure Sunak will necessarily be able to pull that off longer mm. term I mean right now I agree the uh, kind of Tory backbenchers were excited by it because it felt like a return to pre-trust, kind of a return to like the summer, like springtime excitement under Johnson. Um, and it'll be interesting whether he tries to continue that strategy and if he does, whether it continues to land with it's, his kind of delivery and approach. It's interesting because it was a lot, as you say, I completely agree that there was a lot of sort of Johnsonian lines mm -hmm. in there, but it was Johnsonian lines delivered in a sort of Cameron sort of, sure. uh, you know, sharp, quite a sharp way yeah. um, rather than the way that Johnson often did it. Um, as you say, we'll have to see how it goes. Because the, the other thing, just to bear in mind about this Prime Minister questions, it's the first one. There is a lot of the time spent by opposition parties, MPs, were praising um, Sunak, you know, yeah. first um, uh, Prime Minister from Asian heritage. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot of time spent praising him, yeah. um, even from the opposition parties. It's the first Prime Minister's question, so you're naturally going to get a lot of support from your own side. Yeah. So this theoretically should be the easiest Prime Minister's questions we'll that he, week, he's, he's faced. So he should have done well, and he did do well, to be fair to him. Okay, so PMQs, I think generally pretty good performance from both sides. I think your your opinion that you're seeing on Twitter will entirely depend on who you're following and the balance. It's remarkable how people can watch the same thing and see entirely different things. Um, people saying that one had completely destroyed the other, which I think is just untrue on either side. Um, but it'll be interesting, as you say, to see how it plays out. The first one's always interesting because it's the first one, but it's not necessarily the most insightful because it's the first one. So let's move on from PMQs. I'm sure we'll loop back to that next week. Um, we obviously talked about Braverman's appointment in the cabinet. The kind of cabinet appointments happened right at the start of the week, but we've not had a chance to discuss them yet. So beyond Braverman, who's in, who's out, who's kind of notable in the next cabinet? Well, as I mentioned a second ago, the two criteria do seem to be party unity and cabinet mm -hmm. experience. So. Some of his appointments are about appeasing various wings of the party who are natural allies of Sunak's. So yeah. uh, the best examples of this are Braverman and also um, James Cleverly, who's kept his position as foreign sec. Yeah. Um, Cleverly obviously is a big trust and Johnson supporter, um, not a massive fan of Sunak uh, traditionally. So that's a sort of unity appointment. Um, and then aside from that, it's all about who has cabinet experience because mm -hmm. you, you do essentially just need to steady the ship here, yeah. both to appease markets, but also because policy-wise, the UK is looking at a tough couple of years, yeah. probably. 
um, at least until 2024. So Michael Gove returning to leveling up, yeah. for example. Um, Steve Barkley going back to health. He did all that contingency planning um, after COVID, mm -hmm. during COVID. Um, obviously Hunt staying as chancellor. Yes. So yeah, a combination of party unity and cabinet experience. Um, yeah, I think uh, I, th I think it's just it's sort of the right thing to do, the reshuffle. The only interesting thing I'd say is that in terms of his junior ministers, Sunak has clearly, has clearly picked junior ministers in anticipation of a future, future reshuffle. So obviously sure. the, the Bravman appointment, for example, uh, is a little bit uh, controversial, but um, Robert Jenrick, who's a long-term Sunak ally, he actually wrote that um, piece in The Telegraph years ago supporting Johnson with Sunak. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Jenrick is immigration secretary. So okay. clearly the thinking there On is... the path. Yeah, yeah. although the, the problem with this particular line of reasoning is that new prime ministers are almost always at their strongest at the very beginning of their tenure. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to see, given the macroeconomic headwinds, when Sunak is going to have the political power to do another reshuffle yeah. and put in place all his mates yeah. to replace all of those sort of strategic picks, yeah. shall we say. But yeah, so that's that's what the cabinet sort of looks like. I think it's generally the right decision. I mean, the, the two problems facing the Tory party in the country right now are basically a um, Tory party unity is the mm -hmm. first one. You need to sort that out. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just not going to get anything done and you'll probably end up with another general election if you lose another leader. Mm -hmm. And then also just, just massive logistical problems, um, logistical economic problems, which need cabinet experience if they're going to be solved. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. I think the kind of the choice, sorry. No, no, no I, I, I agree. There's not Don't much laugh. else to be said. No. Um, no, that is interesting. And kind of the strategizing there is clearly fundamental to his approach. Yeah. The, Previously, kind of Truss and Johnson had a real kind of affinity it's, for pulling in people that were their friends that weren't necessarily the most suited. And I think maybe that speaks to uh, kind of Sunak's approach, but it also speaks to the times we're in that you, even a politician that wasn't as willing as Sunak seems to be of pulling things together, you're kind of forced to, as you say, you need the people who are the yeah. best at the job. Otherwise, his position isn't secure. Like if, if you have a cabinet full of friends that aren't the best people, you're going to struggle more. Now, I mean, obviously, we've been through a lot of people in cabinets during the 12 year tenure that the Conservatives have had. So how many great people there are left that haven't had a shot yet is questionable. But yeah, no, it's a it's an interesting approach that kind of reflects both Sunak and the moment we're in. Ben, are there any other people you want to pull out that are interesting in or out? I see you've got a list. I have got a list, but I think Zach's done, to be honest, the you've main ones. You've got all of them knocked off your list. Yes. You've got highlights too. You've got more highlights Come on. than I, than mean, I had. I mean, no, you, got, you haven't done this one. <laughs> you you literally point, point, point out them. on my list. Yeah, do you want to do, do that, that one? one? No, you do, do it, Ben. I'll read it. it. Fine, okay. Um, <laughs> Jacob Rees-Mogg is out. He yeah. is obviously a um, Johnson ally and he was very critical of um, Sunak in the leadership election last time. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Sunak was one of the main people who pushed Johnson out. Uh, so it's not too much of a surprise that he didn't get a job, despite sort of at the last minute, in quite a pathetic way, sort of um, saying that he now backs Sunak and kind yeah. of backtracking on what he previously said. It was very clear that he's... Are you actually pointing to people <laughs> well, on the one. list? Well, that's one. <laughs> that's not even one that's highlighted. Do you mean no, Dominic no, Raab? No, that, okay. that is highlighted. Okay. That's a good one. Do you read the list? No, no, no you were list. very good at reading. Okay. Go it's on, a lovely list. I'm very good at reading. <laughs> Go on. Dominic Raab is yeah. the Deputy Prime Minister again, and yes. Justice Secretary, which is a role that he both he's roles done he's done before. before. Yeah. Um, Jeremy Hunt's obviously still Chancellor. We've already done Braverman. Grant Shapps, who was a <laughs> one uh, of transport, Great videos. Yeah, Transport uh, Secretary, who did some great videos. Yeah. He's <laughs> actually leaning over to read yeah. the list. <laughs> Became the business, energy, and an industrial strategy. He's gone to gone there. Who, who are you looking at? Who do you want me to read next? No one else is that great, right? Yeah, they're not many big names. I mean, this, 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 this one's not bad. This one's not bad. Kemi Baden up. Do Baden up. Baden up. Interesting. Yeah. Do ba I'm literally reading one on, sentence. Kemi Baden yeah. is the uh, international trade uh, secretary and president of the board of trade. Very well read. Yeah, very good reading. Lovely really reading. Really impressive. Isn't she also something to do with equalities? Because wasn't that controversy she around was. now? She used to be. No longer. She's not anymore. No longer. Oh, who cares then? Look. Mark Harper actually is an interesting one. He's at Transport, um, who we spoke to. Um, we did. A few weeks ago. So he's the Transport Secretary. He's Technover replacing Grand Chaps. Grand Chaps. Yeah. Well, well, the video good quality knowledge. will be as good. Good knowledge. He was nice. Nice to us. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's my, I mean, that's my I, entire has review. Has he ever had a, a sort of cabinet role before Mark Harper? I mean, whip, doesn't that count? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. Does that count as cabinet? Yeah, I think it does. The so only, me saying he was I... nice was purely in the Zoom call, he was nice. That's not an opinion. Mm. Okay, That's we're n- staying neutral. Read nothing from that. Besides, I... he was a friendly chap in the Zoom call. <laughs> The only other ones that I will say now that reading Ben's lovely list. Go on. The only other interesting ones. Just point them, Ben will read them. Are, <laughs> I'm just going to do it. Um, oh, we've humiliated sorry, his reading ben. skills enough. Um, they, what do you mean? They're great reading skills. Nah, I don't like this podcast. I've decided. Uh, I, think, I think I'm resigning from it's it. It's the lights. Come on, let's get serious. Yeah. <laughs> that was weird. Let's cut that. <laughs> <laughs> No, this bit's great. The, the only other interesting ones, it's I charming. think, are Johnny Mercer and Tom Tugan Hart. They're not highlighted. They aren't highlighted, which I think Johnny is a mistake. Johnny Mercer had already been in that part. position, though, hasn't he? But he'd before? lost it. Then he'd lost it, had been, had been sacked because right. people weren't going to go ahead. He's worried about essentially soldiers being um, charged for crimes during, during the, I think, essentially during the Troubles. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the reason both of those are interesting is because, A, Sunak doesn't have much foreign policy experience. Yes. Um, and those are the two big foreign policy thinkers mm-hmm. um, in, in, well, based in the Tory party, both of them are quite hawkish, which is the, the I was interesting say, thing there. I don't know if you have an answer to this question, so we can cut it if you don't, but that's a good point on Sunak, that he doesn't have much experience in foreign <clears throat> policy, and no. also throughout both leadership campaigns, not that one of them lasted very long, we didn't hear all that much from him about foreign policy. So do no, you didn't. think that these two names or anything else that we've kind of got over the last couple of days gives us an indication of how, what his approach will be? Um, well, I think, talking, just going back to Sunak's foreign policy experience, you're right, he doesn't have any. Yeah. Um, and during the leadership campaigns, the only thing, foreign policy thing that was relevant yeah. w- was a little bit about China. Um, and for, for a couple of days, it looked like Truss's campaign was going to try and paint Sunak as being soft on China. Sure. Um, uh, Sunak's response to this, I, pr- I presume it's, it's sort of reactive. I don't know how much um, it says about Sunak's actual foreign policy, was to basically just go, no, I'm really, really tough on China. I yeah. consider, I think he, the language you used was essentially, I consider China the biggest threat to the, the world order as mm-hmm. things stand. Um, and Tom Tugendhat is, is of a similar position. Tom Tugendhat is famously very hawkish on China and has been before it was fashionable, essentially. So Tom yeah. Tugan has been warning about the dangers of sort of Chinese espionage um, and Chinese intellectual property theft for the best part of a decade now. Okay. Um, so I think that, that that will probably give you a sense of in, in which direction his foreign policy is going to go. I would expect to be quite hawkish, not just because of his cabinet, but also because that is the popular position at the moment. Yeah. Um, the only other way to read this is that he's getting in a load of ex-army guys who are popular with, with that wing of the Conservative Party to soften them up before he lets down Ben Wallace because Ben Wallace wants 3% GDP spending on yeah. military by the end of the year, on defence by the end of the year. And that's very, very expensive. And I think that given the fiscal requirements, mm-hmm. Sunak is going to have to let him down on that. And Wallace has implied quite strongly that he would resign if that was the case. So this could be read as soon as actually softening up that wing of the party Got before it. he, yeah, before Wallace resigns, essentially. It's also just interesting that I know you're saying about Sunak not having much foreign policy experience. Mm-hmm. To be completely honest, I mean, I know he's Chancellor in, um, obviously, lockdown period, but he's only been an MP since 2015, yeah. which is, you know, in terms of actual prime ministers, often they have quite a bit of experience prior to that. Yeah, um, the, it was the just... last few haven't, admittedly, but you're right, going back, and you can probably talk on this better than I can, but going back, years ago mm. it was expected that the prime minister will have been in for decades yeah. and have tons of experience and obviously blair blair and cameron both had experience for opposition at least neither of them have been in politics that long well blair but they both famously, had a lot of experience in opposition and the last few yeah. we've had i mean quite a few of them haven't been in parliament that long and even the ones that have weren't leader in opposition and they came straight into prime minister so i think i think blair got in in 1983 Three, but mm-hmm. I could be wrong. So he'd been in, you know, a, a good little, a good yeah. while. Um, but he he famously said, the opposition. Uh, no, I think that was, that was when he became an MP. Okay. But he, he became prime minister in ninety seven. But he famously his only cabinet position he's ever held was prime minister. Yeah, he'd never had a cabinet position, prior which is to wild. That. But that was more of an exception. I mean, generally you would have people who are always in. If you go back even further, you'd mm-hmm. have people who are all you know they've been in parliament for decades. Yeah. They've had a number of different cabinet roles, and they, they sort of worked their way up. It's more. It's only in more recent years that you you yeah. get. You, we've seen this trend of uh, Boris Johnson, for example. I mean. He hadn't had to. He was foreign secretary, mm-hmm. but I think that was his only major sort of cabinet position. And obviously, yeah. he'd been mayor of London, which at least gave him yeah. a, a senior position. And he'd been in politics for a long time. But there's, you know, um, 
uh, as we've said, you know, uh, Sunak has only been in since 2015. It's a, it's a uh, really short time. I suppose pros and cons of this, like it's not like he's leading this alone. He's surrounded by a whole infrastructure who knows politics very mm. well. And you could argue this trend leads to younger politicians who are more representative of the kind of general electorate. You also end up with politicians of experience in other areas, business, etc. whether that's good, whether that's bad, whatever. There's an argument to be made that this maybe is a good thing. Whether it is in this case, I don't know. But I'm just saying as a counter well, argument. In the 21st century, we've had um, Tony Blair be the youngest prime minister in 200 years. Yeah. Then David Cameron be the youngest prime minister in 200 years. And now Rishi Sunak being the youngest prime minister We're doing in the anti-America. America's desperate to have the oldest president constantly. I yeah. mean, 2024 could be a battle for who's going to be the oldest president between Trump and Biden. Like, it's interesting. That is, yeah. that is, I think it's a genuinely interesting sense in which American and British products are disanalogous. Yeah. And people forget that. But yeah. Okay, so that's the cabinet. Um, that's PMQs as well. So that's been a lot of the week so far. Some big changes. Um, kind of my final question then is, with all of that under Sunak's belt, he's had the first kind of week done. Um, obviously a bit soon to have kind of polling and a response from the public because it takes a while for all that to feed through. But first indications, how is Sunak doing? Has he managed to move the needle back towards the Conservatives? And if so, has it been by enough? Well, well, there's a lot to unpack, but the polling suggests that so far he hasn't had that much of an impact, at least on the headline voting intention. Okay. So the most recent polls still give Labour a 20 point lead at least, mm -hmm. which is massive. I mean, that obviously translates to the general election it is a huge Labour majority. Yeah. Um, Starmer's personal approval ratings are still a little bit behind Starmer's as well. It's worth noting. Um, it's not anywhere near as much as the gap between the Conservatives and Labour, but yeah. he's still sort of 10 points behind Starmer. Um, I think over time you can expect these two figures to converge. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's what normally happens. You normally, if your party approval rating is, is well, if your leader approval rating is high, yeah. your party will naturally tend up towards that sure. as they associate you with more with your party. Um, but I don't think that. But basically, I don't think that his polling is going to continue to go up. I think that he faces a real uphill struggle. Um, and I said that's essentially because of what's supposed to happen on November 17th. That's essentially because he has to deal with this whole um, economic shenanigans that we've got going on. Mm -hmm. And November 17th, just for clarity. Sorry, yeah, November 17th is when Jeremy Hunt is expected to give his new fiscal statement. And the fiscal statement will essentially set out the, the various tax cuts and supply side reforms. It's a new mini budget. It's another mini budget that the this government is going to engage in in order to quote unquote balance the books. Yeah. Um, and here is why I just think it's really, really difficult to see how Sunak maintains his popularity because mm -hmm. Sunak basically has two options here. One, raise taxes and cut spending. Yep. So just sort of, that's just simple balance in the books. Two is supply side reform. So more structural reforms to the UK economy that he hopes in the, in the long term will improve our economic prospects. Um, I think that basically supply side reform is, is palatably popular mm -hmm. while spending cuts just aren't. But I don't think he'll go for the supply side form, reform for two reasons. One, structural changes to an economy take time. The election is due in 2024. They won't have materialized by then. So that yeah. gives a political, well, he doesn't have a political incentive to go forward with that. Two, Sunak was obviously part of the Johnson government and he will have been burned by Johnson's experience with housing. Mm -hmm. um, Johnson, obviously, when he first came into power, wanted to push through significant reforms to housing. And everyone thought he would be able to because he's a massive 80 strong majority. Yeah. But even with that 80 strong majority, even with some fraction of Tory MPs feeling like they owe Johnson his jobs, and without any of the chaos that we've we've seen in the Tory party in the last couple of weeks, Johnson still couldn't get those reforms sure. through. Um, and in the end, they were watered down to the point of non-existence. So I think Sunak would have learned from that experience and, and realized that he, he well, he'll probably think that it's a waste of political capital to try and push through controversial supply side reforms, which means his only option is a combination of tax rises and mm -hmm. public spending cuts. Tax rises, obviously, tax rises on the wealthiest are very, very popular yeah. with the wider public and, and stuff like, you know, windfall taxes on energy companies who've just produced yet more record profits. Mm -hmm. But they don't go down well with the parliamentary party. And yeah. it's tough to see people like Steve Baker, that right wing of the parliamentary party, tolerating that sort of thing, given they don't love Sunak in the first place. Yeah. The alternative is spending cuts, which I think is what he's going to go for. But as we've covered literally every week on this podcast, <laughs> there, there just aren't easy spending cuts available. They've been cut already. They've been yeah. cut already. And it's it's very hard to see where the spending cuts fall, or at least where the spending cuts fall, that don't really piss off the public. Sure. Um, I think obvious candidates here are stuff like freezes on basically stealth taxes on income um, mm -hmm. and perhaps also giving up on that 
defense spending target that Ben Wallace likes so much, which is 3% of GDP yeah. by the end of the, the decade. Um, so once he goes through the spending cuts, I just think that his poll numbers are going to fall even further. There wasn't much appetite for austerity back in the Cameron years. There's even right. less appetite for it now. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's my sort of prognosis. That's what I think is going to happen in the medium term. Interesting. Uh, doesn't look good for him, it yeah. It doesn't look good for doesn't him. Doesn't look good. Ben, I'm, if you've got any comments on polling, I'm interested in hearing them, but I'm more interested as well. How do you think this first week has gone on the whole for him? Obviously, the week isn't fully wrapped. We're recording this on Thursday, mm. a day ahead. Um, but how do you think it's going so far? If you've got any first reads on either polling or the stuff we talked about through the episode. Yeah, so I'll just, I just want to first do the polling thing. And I just want to agree with what Zach said and just going back to what he said at the beginning about the polling numbers. I mm -hmm. um, just want to back him up with the actual figures from you from earlier in the week. Go for it. So, um, you are good at reading, I've got to say. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Um, so the conservatives, <laughs> the uh, conservatives are now on twenty-three points in the polls. Yes, um, Labour fifty-one. So that gives them a twenty-eight point lead. Obviously, we were used to under Trust. She was about thirty points behind in the polls. Twenty-eight is still 28 massive. Is still massive. Just to be clear, this was earlier in the week, so things could have okay. changed by then. All the usual caveats apply. Um, Even still, it's likely to be twenty-something. Yeah, exactly. And then some polling over the weekend, which is actually before Sunak became. Prime Minister mm -hmm. and won the leadership election, but it was you know assumed that he would. Um, Thirty-eight percent of people polled by YouGov had said that they thought that Starmer would be a, uh, the best leader of the two of them. Yeah. Only twenty-nine percent. I know you were saying it's about a ten-point difference, so it's yeah. that is about a ten-point difference. Um, and if you use those numbers then and extrapolate that out to be uh, across the country for mm -hmm. general election, um, they, they found that in so. 389 constituency Starmer actually leads uh, Sunak yeah. in 100 just in 127 uh, Sunak leads and in 116 it was just don't know so almost the same say don't know um, as they say that Su um, Sunak is better than Starmer yeah. so it's not not, not great, not great. but the, the point is and as as Zach was saying he has m moved the um, move polling a little bit more in favour of the Conservatives but just yes. not substantially um, not enough so that was the only thing so okay. basically everything just some numbers to back up what, um, what Zach had said. Um, in terms of uh, his first week, I think it went as well as he could have really hoped for. PMQs was good, mm -hmm. like largely. Yeah. Um, got the party behind him, showed them to be a bit more united. Yeah. Nothing too controversial. Obviously, there's a Braverman thing, mm -hmm. which isn't ideal. Um, but I, that hasn't ballooned into this huge story about him and his government or anything like that. Yeah. So they, they've largely managed to, to, to keep a handle on that for now. I mean, mm -hmm. as you say, we're only recording this on Thursday. It could balloon. Yeah. Still, um, but you know, provided nothing else really happens, I think it, it that, that will probably be fine. And I think, given just the chaos in the last few weeks in politics, his job this week was just to try and calm things down a bit, yeah. settle things out. And I think he largely has done that. Nice. Tory rifts uh, not really being spoken about as much. PMQs was fine. No big bits of legislation that are causing controversy. He sort of calmed everything, which was basically his job. So I think largely his first week's gone well. Have we got time for one more little thing that I've Go gotten by one to mention? One more, it's teensy, teensy little thing. Um, for the, on the polling thing, the thing I watch out for yeah. is Reform UK. Um, sure. Because in the last couple of days, they've gone up from the last couple of weeks even, from like 2% to about 6% in the mm -hmm. polls. That's not a massive jump. Obviously, you're still talking single digits there. Um, but it's, it is significant. And you can see from their campaigning that they consider this a massive opportunity just yeah. because... Obviously, you had Johnson and then Truss. And the thing with Johnson and Truss is obviously, while Truss was a Remainer originally, mm -hmm. and, and Boris Johnson is obviously in some sense an establishment figure, they, then they didn't give off, they gave off Brexity vibes, yeah. and they both railed against the establishment. And that sort of took out the political space for Reform UK. Sunak will try and do those things. You know, Sunak will constantly point the fact that he did actually vote Brexit, yeah, unlike it. Truss. Um, and he's a relatively new MP, so in that sense, he's not an establishment figure. But... And also, actually, some of his policies would be very right-wing. So his yeah. immigration take, for example, he wants to bring immigration way down, which is something the Reform UK should like. Mm -hmm. But just in terms of vibes, he is quite establishment-y. Yeah. He, he is more remainy than his predecessors. Mm -hmm. And he is, I, I, I don't believe this, but you can see how he might be perceived as more, quote-unquote, woke than sure. Johnson, for example, who, who pitched himself as sort of anti-woke and yeah. definitely trusts, who sort of at least tacitly allied with all that cultural war stuff that... Mm -hmm some of our cabinet were indulging in. Um, and so I just think that creates this political space for Reform UK and Reform UK clearly agree with it. So we just want to see, you know, just keep an eye out for that basically okay. in the next couple of weeks. Just so one thing to add to that as well is that they seem to be trying to pick up on 
slighted right-wing um, Tory members who didn't get a vote in this in this mm. one. So they've been running um, some ad stuff on, on, on social media earlier this week, um, which was, uh, again, just trying to pitch to the, the right of the Conservative Party and try yeah. and say, you know, you didn't get a vote for your leader, come join um, Reform it. UK. Um, and obviously, the, the, you know, the right wing of the party voted for trust and she was then ousted by MPs. So there are going to be, uh, you know, a significant number yeah. of the Tory party membership who are frustrated that despite the fact they chose trust, Sunak is now the Got prime it. minister. So Interesting. Mm. One to keep an eye on. Um, OK, that's all we've got time for. That was uh, Sunak's first week. And he said Starmer's first week. Maybe at some point. Better than Rashid Sanouk. I thought that's what you guys thought. <laughs> that wasn't. Yeah. That would have been bad, though. Um, yeah, that was his first week. Uh, we will see how it goes from here. Interesting start. Polling is looking really interesting. Um, um, I guess we'll speak again on Tuesday when we'll be tracking <laughs> trust. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work. Flawless outro.